Buddy, it's Will here from Single Track Magazine and SingleTrackWorld.com. I say good morning because it is morning here in Australia, but good evening or good afternoon uh, or good night even um, if you're watching from a different part of the world. This is indeed YouTube Live. We are live here in the workshop. And today's video, I would like to talk about a new test bike that's just turned up here at the Single Track Southern Headquarters. Uh, now this being a live video, if you've got any questions for me about this bike, um, or if you've got any questions about any of the components on it, um, or perhaps any related questions about a bike you're looking at buying at the moment, or a bike you're riding at the moment, um, let me know. Anything is fair game. Uh, well, mostly. I, th I think there might be some things that YouTube might not allow, but, <laughs> but anything bike related is fair game. So drop them in the comment section below, and uh, I have them here in, uh, in front of me on my phone. And uh, we've just had a comment come through. Oh, hello. Yes, uh, Lundholm, welcome to the live video. We've got a few people watching there. I can see you guys tuning in. So welcome to another edition of uh, Fresh Goods Down Under. I'm kind of going with that name at the moment, so we'll roll with it. But if you can come up with a better name for me, I'll, I'll be more than happy to hear your suggestions. Um, so yeah, today we're gonna have a bit of a chat about this bike. So, oh, Trail Talk MTB, what's up? Hello, welcome, and uh, Lundholm, what's the head angle? Looks steep. Yeah, um, I would actually say in the, um, the video that kind of looks um, slack in that kind of uh, angle. <laughs> um, but yes, we will go into geometry of this bike soon enough. Um, you know, I'll just tell you now, the head angle, mm, 67.3 degrees. Now we are getting a little bit, yeah, there you go, Trail Talk MTV's onto it. You already, you already know of, uh, some details about this bike. And, uh, and look, this isn't brand new. It came out, I think the launch was about six months ago or so. Um, but these have just started trickling through into Australia. These are the carbon version. And this is the one that we've, uh, oh, Trail Talk uh, MTB saying, I reviewed it. Oh, no way. So you've reviewed one of the 8000s. This is the Merida 120. I should uh, let everyone know who's watching, who's just tuning into this YouTube live video. This is a brand new test bike. Um, it's a Merida 120 8000. It's a 2019 model. Now Merida makes this 120 trail bike in a few different versions. So there's an aluminium frame, there's a hybrid carbon slash alloy frame, and there is the full carbon frame, and that's this one here that we're gonna talk about today. Oh, Trail Talk MTB, uh, 600, but have taken a quick spin on the 8000. There you go. So. Trail Talk MTB is just talking about a, um, a cheaper model in the Merida 120 range. Now the 120, as you can probably guess by the clue in the name, is a 120 mil travel trail bike. So this is kind of the bread and butter from Merida. This is the kind of um, ride uphill, ride downhill, uh, technical trails, smooth trails, easy trails, do some six hour, 12 hour, 24 hour racing with some lighter race tires, but then just go to the trail center on the weekend and, and have fun. You know, it's not an enduro race bike, it's not a cross-country race bike, it's sort of somewhere in between. Um, and for me, this is a, a kind of bike that I'm focusing on at the moment. Um, I've just recently finished reviewing the Canyon Neuron CF. Uh, I've also got the Giant Trance 29 in for testing at the moment. This has just shown up. And I've got two more bikes turning, in, turning up in the next couple of weeks, very similar to this kind of genre. So... This is a kind of bike that works well for me. It's a bit more fun and interesting than a pure cross country bike, but then it's not as heavy and full on to ride as an all mountain enduro bike. You know, you don't need as radical steep terrain for this to be fun. So it doesn't necessarily need super gnarly terrain for you to get the most out of it. Uh, had a few more comments come from there. Matthew, yo from Somerset. Hello from Bendigo. Welcome to the live video, Matthew. How is it in Somerset at the moment? Is it, uh, well, it'll be Thursday evening there in the UK. Cold, wet, dry, warm, indifferent. Um, indoors at a pub, don't care. Uh, Michael Clark, greetings from Arizona. Oh, hello, Michael, welcome. Oh, you're, um, you've got a lot of snow over your way at the moment. Don't, did I see that right, that you guys got a lot of rain? Uh, in Ar rain or snow in Arizona? All I know is that it's a bit weird. Uh, Trail Talk MTB should be a sweet, sweet group test. I think you will love the rear suspension. Eats the rock so well for a 120 mil bike. Yes, I've had one ride on this bike so far just to kind of settle in uh, the suspension settings on this bike um, and just get the fit kind of dialed in. I'm going to go out for a longer ride this afternoon and, uh, oh, Matthew, a balmy 13 degrees, 13 degrees Celsius. That sounds quite lovely. 
It's uh, it's meant to be winter there in Somerset, but that sounds um, that sounds quite pleasant and sunny as well. Oh well, there you go. That's um, you're you're doing all right then, given uh, given last year about this time it was bloody snowing all the time. Michael Clark, yep, lots of rain lately, been pretty nice. That's in Arizona, Michael Clark is uh, tuning in from there. I know that because one of my colleagues, Hannah, is heading to Tucson, I think. Uh, I think Tucson, anyway, somewhere in Arizona, and she's going, I believe, next week. She's been looking at the forecast, and it just says rain, 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 rain. So she's, uh, she's been dreaming about going on a desert holiday for a few years, and now it's going to be raining. Um, Matthew, snow last week, though. Yeah, we saw the snow. Um, I know some of the guys back at Tobedon were uh, doing some snowboarding, um, and James Vincent actually snowboarded down Helvellyn in the Lake District. How crazy is that? That's, that's awesome if you can uh, get the right conditions. Um, Sticky Nuts, welcome, Sticky Nuts. There's a Tobedon local tuning in now. Hi there, love the rear links on Merida Bikes. Yeah, this is, um, this is a pretty neat suspension design. Not complicated. Um, and not a lot of sort of like marketing talk around it. I think it's a very straightforward, but well-built, well-designed suspension design. Um, so perhaps we'll talk a little bit about the bike. Uh, Matthew, it was unreal. We're talking about the snow there, right on. So um, yeah, so let's, let's do a, uh, have a bit of a chat about this bike. Uh, we're just talking a little bit about some of the geometry, the suspension design and so on. Now this is the 8,000. So um, in Merida speak, if anyone there is wondering what the hell do the numbers mean and Merida uses this for all of their full suspension bikes and hardtails so if their bike has a number which is 100 or 200 or 500 or 800 if it's divisible by 100 it's an aluminium frame um, if it's a thousand if it's divisible by a thousand in this case 8,000 it's a carbon fiber frame so if it's got an extra zero on the end it's carbon fiber okay so hopefully that explains Oh, we've got people tuning in now. Uh, Greg Katz is saying, not sure about Arizona, but it's cold and snowy in Massachusetts. Cheers. Welcome, Greg. Thanks for tuning into the live video. And we've got Timothy Chihab. Timothy, hey, Will from Switzerland again. Hello, Timothy. Welcome. And uh, you were tuning in last week. So welcome again to the live video. Um, Matthew saying, I thought rocker links were out of vogue these days, referencing Canyon and Specialized. Yeah, you're, so you're talking about the kind of like, the shock link, the little yoke that then drives the rear shock, that's very popular at the moment. Um, yes, Specialized Canyon, also Cannondale have gone that way with the, the new Habit too. Um, I don't think Rockerlings are out of vogue, I think design-wise, perhaps aesthetically. This kind of four bar or faux bar, if you will, suspension design with a rocker link um, compressing the rear shock, there are a lot of brands doing it, and perhaps all mountain bikes are slowly kind of merging into a very similar design. It would kind of appear that way. Um, so Merida isn't playing with anything radical here. There's no kind of crazy suspension innovation, but what they're trying to focus on with the suspension on this bike is to just do something simple and to do it well, and also do it in a way that offers perhaps some structural um, advantages as well. Uh, more so for the aluminium frames, which we'll talk about a little bit later. We've got more comments coming through here. Timothy, looks like an old enduro bike, a Vita Summit CRX Carbon. Slightly different to the Vitus, um, but I know what you're talking about. Uh, what are the brakes and the drivetrain, Matthew, orange style? Yeah, orange, there you go. That's, that's completely different uh, suspension platform and completely different aesthetic to these guys. Right, so Timothy's asking about components, so we will talk about that on that bike. Um, I just want to quickly touch on the carbon fiber frame on this because I think it's really interesting, particularly, as I was saying before, Merida offer three frames in the 120 so you can get the light, I think it's called, L-I-T-E, which is full aluminium. Then there's the C-F-A, which is carbon fiber alloy, and that means carbon front end aluminium rear. And then you've got the C-F-4. This is this frame here, carbon fiber front end, carbon fiber back end. We've got alloy linkage plates here for the rocker link, but otherwise this is the full carbon frame. Now, uh, the reason I say that is I want to tell you how much this weighs because it's lighter than the Canyon Neuron CF that I've just finished reviewing. Claimed weight on the medium frame with the rear shock, with the headset cups, with the cable ports, with the armor on here, with the through axle, so basically all the hardware ready to build a frame, uh, ready to build up from a frame set. 
claimed weight is 2,779 grams, which I think is pretty impressive given how burly this frame looks um, and given it's, uh, you know, it's designed as a tough little trail bike. 2,779 grams is the claimed frame weight. Now, compared to the previous 120 carbon fiber trail bike, Merida says it's 400 grams lighter. So it's dropped 400 grams, which is a really big percentage. I was gonna try and do the maths in my head then, but I can't, if anyone else is willing to do that. Uh, 400 grams they've dropped going to this new frame, uh, which is pretty damn impressive, I think, personally. Um, now, when you go to the hybrid frame with the carbon front end and the alloy back end, you're gonna add nearly 500 grams. So this carbon fiber back end is 455 grams lighter than the aluminium version, so that's a lot. Now, how's the weight difference between the full carbon frame and the full aluminium frame? And the alloy frame comes on the cheaper 120 models, the carbon frame comes on the two top end spec. It's nearly a kilogram lighter than the aluminium frame, 915 grams. That's a huge amount, that's a huge percentage um, compared to the full aluminium frame on the cheaper versions of the Merida 120. Right, so yeah, full carbon frame, lots of really neat features on this. Oops, I've lost the screen there. Have we got anyone tuning in there? Hello? Oh no. It looks like we've lost video. Hey, I think we're back in the house. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Are we back on? I think we're back on. I can see me on the screen. We're back! Hey! Alright. I'm very sorry about that. Some, some weird interruption there with the, uh, with the stream. But anyway, we're all back on. Sticky nuts. You froze. Yeah. Not, uh, not literally. Trail Talk MTB. Insanely light. So we were just talking about the carbon fiber frame on this Merida 120 8000. Um, they've said that the frame is stronger than the 160 carbon. Holy moly, that's impressive. The 160 is the 160 millimeter travel enduro bike. This is the 120 millimeter travel trail bike. So we're talking about um, a sub three kilogram frame with the shock and hardware. Um, it's nearly a kilogram lighter than the aluminium version, which I think is really interesting because these days we're finding that the difference between an alloy frame and a carbon frame in some brands is actually quite small. Um, the Canyon Neuron CF, um, to reference that as a bike that I've recently reviewed, the difference is less than 200 grams, but in this case, it's nearly a kilogram, which is a whole lot of weight saving if you go up to the carbon fiber version. We've just had some comments coming through here. Um, Matthew's saying, often little difference between alloy and carbon seems worth it. Yeah, exactly. There's, it's sort of getting to the point there that either aluminum is getting a lot lighter or the carbon frames are actually getting a bit heavier and the difference is kind of shrinking a little bit, but this particular bike, there is a hefty weight difference there um, by going to the carbon version. Um, all right, so we've got everyone here all tuning in, all hanging out. Thank you very much, and apologies about that uh, feed dropping out there. Um, right, so we should probably talk about some of the components on this bike and the geometry. Um, I wanna talk about some highlights on this bike and why I'm excited about testing this, because uh, there's some really interesting spec choices on this bike um, that kind of, I don't know, that are a bit surprising for a Merida short travel trail bike. Uh, Timothy, I like the setup you used on your GoPro for the Neuron last ride review. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, that worked really well, didn't it? That was a Hero 7. Um, the footage on that thing is so smooth, like ridiculously smooth. I believe they call it hyper smooth. Um, but yeah, with the chest cam and then the other um, camera, that was a Hero 5 I had on the handlebar. Um, so that worked really well. I'm going to be doing a ride review on this bike as well. So I'm going to be fine tuning a few things, but, um, but so far I think it's going okay. All right. Oh, we've got Woody Hardboner in, in here. I'm late. Oh, well, welcome. It's all right. Don't stress. We've got plenty to talk about. So don't worry about being a little bit late to the live video. Um, and do, 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 do. Timothy's saying the FSA wheels look super nice. Yes, they do. That is a really interesting spec choice. Let's talk about that actually. These are FSA Gradient wheels. Now on the Merida website, they're called Gradient Limited. On here, they're called the Gradient Wide R29. I don't know which, which is the correct name, but anyway, they're basically the same thing. Carbon fiber rims. These are 29 millimeters internally wide, which is a good 
broad kind of trail or mountain width. I think it suits this sort of 2.35 to 2.5 inch tires quite well. Um, and speaking of tires, look at this. We've got a Maxxis Minion DHR2 front tire. It's a 2.4 inch wide trail, no less. So it's quite an aggressive front tire for what is a 120 mil travel trail bike. I mean, if you look at Merida's version of this from a few years ago, the thing would have had 12 racing Ralphs or knobby nicks. It would have had remote lockout suspension. It would have had a head angle like that. It would have been probably 10 kilograms, super light. Um, but it would have had a really short top tube, you know, really short and steep and awkward. Um, to look at this bike now and to see where Merida has come from, from those sort of earlier days where everything was all about weight and efficiency and lockouts and making a cross country bike with a bit more travel. This is from, at least from what I can tell, that kind of more purpose built agro trail bike. So we've got that Maxxis Minion front tire, 2.4 inch wide trail. Um, that's a DHR2, 3C Max Terra, no less. So a very high end tire. Uh, Timothy, I'm building a new enduro bike with a Canyon Strive frame. Oh, right on. That's the new Canyon Strive or the previous Canyon Strive? That'd be interesting to know. Uh, Matthew is saying the Neuron review was very good. Oh, thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And Trail Talk MTB saying, will be interesting to see how stiff they are for a 24 hole rim. Uh, yes, 24 spokes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 24 spokes. Yes, you are correct. Um, carbon fibre rims, so they're quite, or did, they should be quite stiff. These have a relatively tall depth as well, so it'll be interesting to see how they ride. But that's kind of the idea with using less spokes, is to get a, a little bit more flex and give in there, because the rim is potentially quite stiff. Um, Spec highlights. I want to talk about the brakes. SRAM code RSC. So you might not be able to see that so well in the, uh, the video, but someone was asking before, there was a comment asking what the brakes are. SRAM code RSCs, which are a downhill brake. They're designed for World Cup downhill racing, and yet here they are on this carbon fiber trail bike, a Merida carbon fiber trail bike. So I think that's pretty cool. I'm a big fan of the SRAM code RSCs. I much, much prefer them to guides. I find the lever is really solid and the power is outrageous while still having good kind of modulation. So big fan of those SRAM code RSCs. Oh, few comments coming through here. Uh, do, 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 do. All, uh, so Timothy's talking about he's building up a bike at the moment, Canyon Strive. He's got the old frame um, and he's got some TRP brakes as they have a sponsorship with them. Oh, nice little plug there. Well done, Timothy. <laughs> um, those Strives look really nice, by the way. Uh, Matthew, I think these agro trail bikes are very appealing. Absolutely agree. And that's why I'm kind of focusing on testing these bikes at the moment. As I said before, I've had the Canyon Neuron CF. I've got the Giant Trance 29 at the moment. I've been riding a Trek Fuel EX, even though I'm not reviewing one. I've just been riding one for shits and giggles. Shed Life Guy in the house. Hi, Will. Hey, Shed Life Guy. Welcome to the live video. And um, we're just talking about some of the trail bikes, agro trail bikes we've been testing at the moment. Um, I've also got this Merida 120. Um, and I've got two bikes turning up in the next few weeks, which you'll, you'll hear about soon enough. Um, but yeah, this kind of 110 to 130 mil trail, trail bike, new generation trail bike that you can do basically, well, borderline everything on. Um, Greg Katz, 120 mil, 29 er trail bikes are king in New England. Yeah, right on. So it's, uh, it's, it's a good style of bike in New England. Certainly where I am here in uh, Bendigo, Australia, this kind of thing is ideal. Uh, Trail Talk MTB, especially in Australia. Yep, exactly. I hear you on that one. Uh, Timothy's asking, did you ever ride in Cairns? Yes, I have ridden in Cairns. Um, I went up there for the first World Cup, which was 2014, 2015. The first World Cup that they had back there. Um, I rode Smithfield and uh, the Atherton Tablelands as well. And it was fantastic. I had a really, really good time on there. Very hot and muggy though. That's proper tropical rainforest up there in Cairns. It's a very different climate to what it is down here in Victoria. Michael Clark's asking, do you prefer the Fuel EX over this bike? How about the Stumpy Short Travel? Really good question, Michael. Um, the Fuel EX, look, I've only had one ride on this bike, so I'm not gonna sort of delve in too much about how it compares to other bikes in this genre, because I need more time on it. Um, but the Fuel EX has a little bit more travel on the back, it's 130. And I think the Fuel EX is 130 or 140 on the front, uh, whereas this is 130, 120. 
Um, the Fuel EX is such a capable bike. I, every time I ride that bike, I'm kind of blown away with how enduro capable it is for what is a short or mid travel 29er. Um, that Fuel EX is a really, really good bike. Um, I know my colleague Rob is currently testing one in the UK and we'll have a full review of the EX 9.7. So that's a carbon mainframe alloy back end. Um, that's coming on the website literally in the next couple of weeks. And he's also reviewing the GT Sensor, another short mid travel 29er trail bike. So these kind of bikes are going gangbusters at the moment. Loads of brands releasing new, uh, new models, new versions. Um, and they're all getting better and better. Shed Life Guy, are uh, all your bikes green? Yeah, clearly. <laughs> That's the prerequisite at the moment, isn't it? <laughs> um, we've got MRGW in the house. What do you think about floating suspension design? Great comment for me to then segue into the rear suspension design. So this is 120mm travel on the back. The hint is in the name, it's the Merida 120. Uh, so 120mm travel on the back, and it's the floating link suspension design. This is basically a single pivot suspension design. So you've got one chainstay here mounted to the main uh, mounted to the main pivot on the mainframe here. One chainstay. So it's essentially that part there is what you would call single pivot. Then we have a pivot above the rear axle, and that connects the uh, carbon fiber seat stay up to the rocker link here. Compresses the rear shock. Now the floating link element. This is to do with how the shock is bolted onto the frame. Instead of mounting the rear shock to the main frame, the rear shock actually floats between the linkage. It's mounted to the rocker link and an extension of the chainstay. So what happens there is as the suspension compresses, the lower mounting point for the rear shock actually rotates away ever so slightly. And the idea there is to give a little bit more of a bottomless kind of feel to the end of the travel. Trek do it on the Fuel EX with their full floater. Um, suspension design, um, other brands do it as well. Mondraka do it on their uh, zero, uh, zero suspension design. I can't remember the name. Um, on the Mondraka, it's the opposite though. They actually drive the rear shock from both ends. Um, so there are numerous brands out there doing various takes on this floating shock suspension design. The key, um, the key point between all of them is that the rear shock, it doesn't mount to the mainframe. So the rear shock floats inside the linkage. That's where the name comes from. So it's a 120mm travel back end. It's got that floating link suspension design. Here's where I think things get quite interesting. This is a RockShox Deluxe RT3 rear shock. It comes with a debonair can, which is the big negative spring volume. So nice big spring volume. We've got a matching debonair spring in the RockShox Pike fork up front. But the debonair can on here, the stroke on this shock is 55 millimeters. Now, if anyone out there wants to do the maths, 120 mil travel, 55 millimeter stroke shock. Can you tell me the average leverage ratio? And uh, I'd like you to work this out, hopefully, if you guys, yeah, Trail Talk MTB, super low leverage. So you know, if anyone can do the maths, that'd be great. I have the number written down here in case uh, we don't have anyone who can work that out. Um, Timothy, do you have to pay for you to test bikes? Good question. No. <laughs> um, the really good thing for me as a tech editor for single track, I can test basically whatever bikes I want. Um, I have free reign. Whether a company advertises with single track or not, it doesn't matter. We get to test whatever bikes, whatever product we want. I understand, and I'm not going to name names or anything like that because I couldn't name names to be honest, but I understand there are publications out there that exist in this world that will only test bikes from companies that advertise with them. Single track doesn't do that. Um, that's a big, big no-no for us. Uh, we have completed your question, but no, there's no, <laughs> there's no money that changes hands with reviews. I have heard that does happen, um, which to be honest, I think is complete and utter bullshit, um, but no, we don't do anything like that. All right, so we've got some more questions coming through. Uh, something about all these float link bikes, this is Trail Talk MTB. Something about all these float link bikes, whether it's Merida or Trek, just seem to handle the rust stuff so well. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd, I'd probably agree with you there. Uh, Matthew, Yeti had a system like that too. Uh, did they? I don't know. We, are we going back a bit now? This might be a, an older model, um, but all the Switch and Switch Infinity bikes, they use a rear shock that's mounted to the mainframe, as far as I'm aware. Um, <laughs> Trail Talk MTV, my math sucks, Matthew, like two-ish. Yeah, two-ish is pretty close. Um, right. We're talking about the leverage ratio on this rear suspension design. The average leverage ratio 
is you take the suspension travel of 120 millimeters and you divide it by the travel of the shock. In this case, it's 55 millimeters. And you end up with roughly 2.18 to one. If you don't know what that number means, all you need to know is it's really low. It's really low, especially for a trail bike like this. And what it means is for every millimeter that the shock travels, the rear wheel moves in a vertical plane 2.18 millimeters. So it's nearly two to one, thereabouts. Um, that's a really low leverage ratio, particularly when a lot of bikes might be closer to three to one, where you get one millimeter shock stroke to three millimeters of vertical wheel travel. Doesn't sound like a big difference, but on, it, it can potentially be a very big difference. Um, what it means to you when you're setting up this bike is this rear shock uses quite low pressures. Now I weigh around 70 kilos with my shoes and my backpack on ready to ride. Shock pressure on this so far, and again, I'm doing a bit of tuning at the moment, 110 PSI, that is really, really low. So you've got a big air can on there, a long stroke relative to the amount of travel on the back, and that generally means you're running lower air pressures than if this shock was a smaller kind of unit and it had a higher overall leverage ratio. Now I should point out there that we're talking about average leverage ratio. So that is over the entire stroke, it averages out 2.18 to one. It obviously changes through the travel. So to begin with, it's slightly higher. It might be closer to about three to one. Um, and then as you go through the travel to get that kind of progression and that ramp up towards the end of the travel, the leverage ratio will decrease a little bit. Now I don't have any graphs or anything like that in front of me, um, but I will find that out for you if you're interested. I am, but I don't know if you are. Um, okay, we've got LV Joe here. Where is this bike from? How much US? Uh, I don't have US pricing on this Merida. The, the brand is Merida, they're a Taiwanese brand. Um, their design office is in Stuttgart in Germany. We actually visited there two years ago and got to see all of the design and engineering and testing that goes on in-house. And the German team, the Stuttgart team, basically spearhead the design of all of the mountain bikes and road bikes as well. Um, and they're manufactured in Taiwan. Of course, Merida is a huge bike manufacturer. They manufacture bikes for all sorts of brands. Um, they basically own nearly half of Specialized, if, uh, or they used to, I don't know if they still do, but they're a big player with Specialized. They manufacture Specialized bikes and a load of other brands. So they're primarily a manufacturer, but they do all of their own bikes and all of those are designed in Germany, which to be honest, when you look at this bike and the, the, the suspension design and the frame design, you can see that it is got that kind of German flair to it. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, that's Canyon Lux low. Yeah, so Matthew's just talking about the leverage rate of the suspension design compared to the Canyon Lux. Yes, very, very low. Uh, Timothy, will you do a review on an Orbea or Rallon and on the Trick Stuff brakes? I heard they are great. Yes, already reviewed the Trick Stuff brakes. We reviewed the Trick Stuff Duratessimas. Hands down, best brakes I've ever used. Absolutely phenomenal brakes. Super expensive as well. Um, I'd love to try out those new Maxima brakes, which are meant to be even more powerful and even better and even more expensive. They're ridiculous. I think they're like a thousand euros an end. I don't know. They're, they're some crazy price, but yes, very good. I haven't ridden the Orbea Rayon. Um, I would love to, um, but uh, Orbea doesn't have a huge presence in Australia. So chances of me getting a test bike are fairly slim, but we'll see what we can make happen. Um, they are a very nice looking bike, that's for sure. Um, Trail Talk MTB, considering how good air shocks are in terms of sensitivity, etc., is there much negative in going such a low leverage ratio? That's a really good question. I think there are potentially two negatives of a low leverage ratio. One is for lighter riders. Now, if you were, say, 50 kilos, then you're going to end up with very, very low pressures in the shock to the point where tuning it might be a bit difficult. You might find that the damping is a bit heavy. So I've found on this already that the rebound damping is really quite slow. So I've had to back it off nearly all the way. It's probably one or two clicks off full fast, which is for me is, uh, that's, that's, quite, that's not a lot of rebound damping. So the tune on this shock um, and that low leverage ratio, it makes the damping, it gives the damping greater effect or it feels like it has more of an effect. So you need to run less damping, particularly if you're a lighter rider. So a super low leverage ratio, not necessarily a good thing for really light riders. This bike does come in a small, so there are potentially gonna be light riders out there who will get this bike 
they might find that they'll need to custom tune that rear shock and it might be a bit too heavy handed on the compression damping. The other negative is that with a low leverage suspension design, you end up with a lot of shock movement for the amount of wheel travel. So the shock moves quite a bit. So potentially you might end up with uh, maybe more wear on the seals from that physical kind of movement. But the flip side there is that you're running a lot lower pressures inside. So perhaps the seals are under less duress. I'm not entirely sure which one is kind of preferable. Would be good to speak to a suspension technician to, to find out that answer, you know, which requires more servicing. I'm not entirely sure, um, but there are pros and cons of each. Right, uh, Sticky Nuts, Orbea Rayon is superb. Yeah, it's a good looking bike, huh? And I've heard very good things about it. Um, Timothy is plugging TRP brakes, so <laughs> I'm gonna let you continue to do that. Um, Trail Talk MTB, with the new metric shocks and super deluxe, etc. Yeah, so I guess we'll, um, that's, a, that's a good point you've raised. Metric shock on here, and the way that this shock mounts to the frame is the trunnion mount. Um, now that gives a fairly small package uh, with a lot of stroke in this shock, but it also puts two cartridge bearings on either side of the head of the shock. So you've got two bearings there that drive the rear shock rather than a DU bushing, and those two bearings, in theory, will provide a little less stiction to get the suspension moving. So it should have a more supple kind of uh, starting stroke by removing the, the traditional DU bushing or nylon bushing from the top and using two metal ball bearings on either side of the shock heads. So metric trunium bearing shock there, all very uh, to the latest standards and mod cons. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. So Alfonso's tuning in here to the YouTube live video. This Merida versus the Green Trance, your favorite. Uh, I don't have a favorite just yet. I'm really enjoying the Giant Trance 29, I should say. That bike is freaking awesome. Um, sorry, spoiler alert there, but I'm really enjoying that bike. Um, it's There are a few things that, um, that I don't love about it, but that bike's going really well. The, the Merida 120 is kind of down a similar kind of path. You know, it's a 29er, 120 mil travel trail bike. We've got 130 mil travel pike on the front of it. We're talking before about the Maxxis Minion DHR2 front tire, 2.4 inch wide trail, carbon fiber rims, 29 millimeter internal width on those, SRAM code RSC brakes, basically downhill brakes, full length 150 mil dropper. That's a KS Integra Lev dropper pose, full length. Thank you very much, Marita. Thumbs up for that one. It's a really aggressive build kit for a 120 mil travel trail bike, especially from Merida. Um, so it's definitely going down that same kind of aggro trail path that the Giant Trance 29 is on. Um, so very similar kind of feel, I think, in terms of what they're laying out, what, what they're kind of laying out there. Let's talk about geometry. That's probably a good point to kind of talk about comparison on geometry on here. Head angle, 67.3 degrees. That is quite slack, I think, um, for a 29er with 120 mil travel. Um, not quite as slack as the Giant Trance 29, which is 66.5. So this is 67.3. It's quite steep in the seat angle. It's 75.5 degrees. So that is quite modern, you know, very contemporary kind of seat angle there. Um, and the chainstay length, it's worth noting that compared to the old version of the 120, this bike has got a degree, I think about a degree slacker in the head angle. It's got steeper in the seat angle. Merida's lobbed off 10 millimeters off the chainstay length. So this is 435 millimeters, which I think is the sweet spot for the rear center length on uh, these 29er trail bikes. 435 mil rear center. And if you're wondering, there are four frame sizes in the 29er model. The reach is 415 for the small, 435 for the medium that I'm testing here. 455 for the large and 475 for the XL. Not super long. So, you know, in terms of today's contemporary uh, reach measurements and everyone going super long, um, it isn't massive, 435 on the medium. And if you're a really tall rider, 475 m might not be enough. Um, I don't know. Um, I'm only 175 centimeters tall, so I fit a medium in most brands, um, but 435 mil reach on here. So quite contemporary angles, fairly kind of middling reach measurement on here. Um, we've got a 60 millimeter long stem, 760 millimeter wide bars, which is basically the same cockpit setup as the Canyon Neuron CF. In fact, the reach is only two millimeters longer on here. 
but a few differences like that steeper head angle, uh, slacker head angle, steeper seat angle. Just had some more comments coming through here. Do, 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 do. Uh, Trail Talk MTB saying, uh, yeah, I'm around 85 kilos and high leverage bikes just feel weird now. Yeah, it's, um, they definitely have a different feel. I think, um, I think all suspension designs, like as we were talking about, small changes in geometry, small changes in the suspension design in terms of linkages and pivots, they can look very similar, but often the performance can be wildly different between them. All right, Matthew's asking how much in pounds sterling for this build? Excellent question, Matthew. I have that information right here on my sheet. And this I think is really interesting. And this I think is really interesting um, because I'm used to it being the other way around. So in the UK, this is the 128,000. There is a 129,000, um, but I don't know if that comes into the UK. I'm not entirely sure, um, which comes with Kashima suspension and, and, and higher end build kit. So this is the 8,000. So we've gone through some of the specs already, carbon wheels, SRAM code RSE brakes, we've got a SRAM X01 drivetrain with carbon fiber cranks, KS lead Integra drop post, full carbon frame, rock shock suspension package, RCT3 fork with the Charger 2 damper. Very, very high end build kit, I think. 6,000 pounds. So this is the second from the top model, 6,000 pounds for the Merida 128,000 in the UK, in Australia, the pricing is really aggressive. Now, 6,000 pounds, if anyone wants to do the conversion, would work out to about $10,000 Australian. It's not $10,000 Australian, it's just under, it's $1 under 7,000, 6,999, 6,999. So 7,000 Australian dollars for this bike. So that is very, very aggressive pricing for this bike in the Australian market. Um, if you're outside of Australia, if you're watching from the UK, you probably have no idea what those numbers mean. That's absolutely fine. Don't worry about it. All I'm saying is it's quite cheap for what you're getting for your money. Um, Matthew, that's more than both my cars. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Um, Thunderstruck Coach is in the house after a decade on full suspension bikes. I'm now on a 2019 Santa Cruz Chameleon 27.5 plus hardtail and I'm having the most fun I've ever had on a bike. Not even close. Awesome, man. The Chameleon is a rockin' bike and uh, yeah, I totally agree. Um, a lot of modern hardtails, especially with plus tires, make a huge difference to comfort and traction. And with modern geometry on, um, on these contemporary hardtails, they can be a load of fun. Um, particularly on the right trails, but you can ride them anywhere, really. Um, but yes, back to the Merida 120. Um, if you've got any questions for me about this bike, just pop them in the comment section below. We're doing the live Q&A on YouTube. Trail Talk MTB, Advanced Traders, the supply is super aggressive with their pricing. So we're talking about Australian pricing on this bike. Um, it's probably easier to get the bikes from Taiwan to Australia versus the UK. I think you're probably right. It's probably cheaper shipping, isn't it? Probably a bit faster to get from Taiwan to Australia than from Taiwan to the UK. Um, so yeah, phenomenal value for money, I think. Um, it's a, what, about $700 more than that giant Trans 29er that we, uh, we did the video on a couple of weeks ago. Um, both have full carbon fiber frames, but the componentry you get on this bike, like the X01 drivetrain, the FSA carbon wheels, the SRAM code RSE brakes, it's really impressive. I think if you bought this bike, there's very little that you want to upgrade out of the box. Maybe you want to put on a carbon handlebar, you know, to do that thing and shed a bit of weight. Um, you know, a carbon rail saddle if you wanted to drop a few more grams. Um, but it's pretty impressive out of the box, isn't it? I, I think, anyway. Um, I'll have a first look story on this on singletrackworld.com. So if you want to see the full specs, pricing, geometry, all the, uh, all the you know, goo goo gaga we've been talking about, the rear suspension design, uh, feel free to jump on the website. That'll be live hopefully within the next hour when I get home and uh, upload it. Um, but yeah, I'm really impressed with this on paper. Um, the question is, how will that translate onto the trail? So I have had one ride to get it dialed in so far, but I've got many rides over the next uh, couple of months on this bike to really see what it can do. Timothy uh, from Switzerland is saying, I'm looking to find a bike for mum. 130 to 140 mil travel and 27.5. What bike would you recommend? Was thinking of the Canyon Neuron Women. Very good question. Yeah, that could be, uh, that could be a good option. Um, the depends how tall she is, because the Neuron is 29 in the bigger sizes and 27.5 in the smaller sizes. So that will be worth checking out. Um, Trail Talk MTB, we're talking about the Merida 120. He is saying, 
or the 800 build is great value for money. Yeah, I think a lot of them are representing a, a really good value for money. The base model, I know this in the UK, the base model is 1500 quid, 1600 quid, which is really, I think it's the 400, the 120, 400, crazy value for money. Uh, Matthew, how much would benefit, um, would a competent rider feel between a six grand bike and say a three grand build of this model? Oh, that's a really good question, Matthew. Um, it completely depends on the, the bike. If we're talking about the 120 here, I've not ridden the alloy model, so I can't compare directly. I can't say that one is better than the other in terms of ride quality. And really, this is early days. This is brand new for us, this test bike. Um, and I want to get loads and loads of riding on it. I want to play around with different tires and wheels. I'm going to be testing, uh, swapping the fork around because this is a 51 mil offset. I'm doing an offset feature at the moment, so I want to try a different offset on here as well. Um, but that is a really good question. The difference between a three grand bike and a six grand bike, perhaps if we've got anyone watching here at the moment who's made that upgrade, maybe they've gone from a three grand to a six grand bike, maybe they could let Matthew know what their experience was uh, or what your experience was of making that upgrade, whether it's worth it. Because I think there is a point where there are diminishing returns. And uh, to be honest, around that sort of three to four grand mark, you'll get a great high quality aluminum frame you'll get fantastic quality suspension, good brakes, good wheels, good tires. You can make upgrades to the components over time. The drivetrain, that's easy to buy new derailers and stuff like that. Don't worry about that too much, but focus on the frame, suspension, wheels, and tires, first and foremost, because those are the most expensive things to upgrade. Um, but I think around that three to four grand mark, you'll, three to four grand mark, you'll get a really good bike. Once you go up to that six grand mark, like this one here, you are going to get a lighter bike. So this carbon frame, we were talking about how much lighter it is than the aluminium version. It's nearly a kilogram lighter. Now, in terms of percentages, that's a really healthy percentage compared to the aluminium bike. So you do get a lighter bike that's going to make climbing a bit easier. That's going to make um, handling in tight, twisty trails a bit easier because you've got less mass to kind of move around on the trail. Um, so there, there are benefits there with going up to that next price point. It just depends whether your riding is going to uncover those advantages enough to make it worthwhile. And that's a difficult question for me to answer. Um, so it does depend a little bit on the brand and the model as well. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Matthew, six grand is just too much for a bike. I agree. I, um, me personally, speaking from a very personal perspective, if you knew how much that uh, bicycle journalists got paid, you'd know that six grand uh, <laughs> is a lot of money and there's no way I'd be able to ever afford anything like this personally. Um, I prefer just to test ride them and then give them back when I'm done. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of money. But uh, hey, I'm, I'm not judging whether people want to buy a 10 grand bike or a thousand dollar bike or a $200 bike. You buy what works for you and your budget. And uh, hey, they're all bikes, you're gonna have fun on them. Um, but yeah, as far as, uh, as far as price goes, what was the bike that I saw recently? Oh, I think um, because of the, uh, that new SRAM AXS group set, which is very expensive, once you kind of add these kind of top end components and you look at things like Yetis and uh, Intense and Santa Cruz, the prices are freaking crazy. So, but they're selling, you know, people are selling these bikes, so. Um, yeah, I mean, people are out there buying them. Um, so whether I can afford it or not, it doesn't matter. There are people out there who can um, and are buying these high-end bikes. So good on them. If they enjoy it and it brings them joy, then fantastic. Uh, do, 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 do. Trail Talk MTB. That's why I'm living at home as long as possible with the parents. Yes, save the money while you can. If it's an option, do it. Uh, Matthew, I hear you, mate. Thumbs up. Yeah, I think we're all on the same, uh, same page there. Uh, sticky nuts. That's why I kicked the kids out. <laughs> you had to kick them out, huh? It was time for them to grow up and uh, leave the nest. <laughs> yeah, kids, they can, they can be expensive, can't they? Uh, Thunderstruck Coach. For me, I spend 3200 for my S Plus Chameleon build and then added the new DVO Sapphire 34. Nice fork. So for under 4K, um, I have a killer bike. Always get more for your dollar for aluminium frames and no suspension. Yeah, absolutely. If, you, if you're looking for value for money, aluminium hardtails. I mean, it doesn't get much more uh, value oriented than that. Trail Talk MTB. Save it, you mean spend it on bikes, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Saving money by living with the parents and directing it towards buying new bikes. Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's definitely the way forward. That's a e economics 101. 
Um, right, so I think we've, uh, we've covered all the details on this bike so far. Now I'm going to be riding this bike over the next few weeks and I will be doing some video from the trail, so we'll take out the GoPro, um, we'll get you some footage from riding on the trail just to see how this bike goes compared to those other kind of short travel trail bikes we've been chatting about. Um, that I'm testing. I'm going to be doing a video next week on the Giant Trance 29, so look out for that one. If you've got any questions for me about that Giant, drop them in here, the comment section, um, and I'll see if I can answer them for you. Um, I don't know if you guys already saw the review of the Canyon Neuron, but that's live on YouTube. Um, the full written review is live on our website, which is singletrackworld.com. Um, jump on there if you want to have a bit of a read. I've gone into loads of detail about my experience with that bike. Um, so feel free to check that out and uh, let me know your feedback if you like that review or not. Um, Thunderstruck Coach, I can't wait to watch the reviews, best on YouTube. Thank you very much, mate. I'm really glad you're enjoying it. And thank you to all for uh, tuning into these live videos, um, for throwing me out questions, throwing me out comments, joining the conversation. It makes it really interesting for me and, uh, and I'm thrilled you guys are enjoying it. I'm enjoying it a load myself um, and I've got a lot more videos on the way. Oh, we've got uh, Who 29 Inch Web. Um, I'm not sure what you mean, Danielle. Uh, Trail Talk MTB, keep up the good work, Will. The reviews have been great and the live streams are perfect for breakfast viewing. Awesome, glad I can help out there. Breakfast in Australia or dinner in the pub in the UK, either way. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying. Um, right, okay, I'm gonna leave it there because I've got to head out. I'm gonna take this bike out onto the trail, get riding on it, get it tuned in, and uh, yeah, just uh, see how it goes. Right, so I hope you guys have got lovely riding plans for the weekend, wherever in the world you're watching from. And um, as always, give, a th give us a thumbs up if you've enjoyed the video. And, uh, oop, Thunderstruck Coach, somewhere in the middle for California. Ride on, enjoy. I hear you guys have also had a load of rain over there as well as Arizona, all on the west coast, huh? Which is, uh, I've seen some photos of green things, which is very unusual for that part of the world. Um, Thunderstruck Coach, thanks, we'll see ya. Awesome, no worries. And uh, yes, we'll see you guys next Friday for another live YouTube video. Um, I'll have some other cool stuff to show you by next week. And uh, as I said, jump on the website, singletrackworld.com to look for the first look on this bike, um, the review of the Canyon Neuron CF, and uh, give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video, and uh, we'll see you next time on YouTube Live. Thanks so much for tuning in, guys. Really enjoyed that, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, as well, and I'll see you guys next week.